Welcome to this week's edition of The Scots in Us. I'm Camilla Hellman, President of the American Scottish Foundation, and I'm delighted that you're joining us today as we have conversations with two of Scotland's most leading artists. Andy Scott, the creator of the phenomenal Kelpie sculptures, and Gerard Burns, best known for his art of ballerinas and sought out flags, and now also returning to music where he started from. And so without more ado, let us join Andy Scott. Hello. Andy, hello. hello. Nice to chat. Hi, how are you doing? I can't believe it's been so long since we've been able to catch up. Absolutely. Time flies when you're having fun, eh? <laughs> no. And you're now the other side, not just of the, the Atlantic, you're yeah. right the way across the United yeah. States. Well, we're on the other ocean now. Yeah, we after five years in Philadelphia, which we had uh, where we had a great time, uh, we decided to shake things up a bit, start all over again, and we relocated over to here to Los Angeles. So, yeah, we've been here for two, nearly two and a half years, and very much enjoying life and uh, work here on the on the West Coast. And inspiring you? Uh, it's certainly not short of inspiration. Yes, it's a very, very, very different environment to the East Coast. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it, it's probably even more of a, a, a leap than it was from Scotland to the East Coast. The West Coast is so different, it feels like more of a foreign country in many ways. So it's been very interesting, inspirational, and uh, it's not been without its challenges, I have to say, but we're really enjoying it. And uh, I've got a nice studio here, we've got a nice little house, so everything's cool. Yeah, it's very good. Well, it's 10 years since we worked together yeah, yeah. around bringing those wonderful maquettes yes. of the Kelpies to uh, New York. Yeah, 10 years already. Incredible, isn't it? And you, at that point, were completing a project, uh, the Kelpie project took basically a 10 years of, in front of that, didn't yeah. it? More or less, yeah, more or less. I think if we narrowed it down, it would have been, I think, probably about eight and a half in total. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with a preamble of a, maybe a year or so doing all the initial sketchy designs. Yeah, people are often surprised when they find out it was such a long uh, incubation period for them. But the bigger the project, the more bureaucracy goes with it, politics and finance, as you can imagine. And uh, politics, finance. Yeah, yeah, it became it became a it became a monster that we had to feed, you know. <laughs> so, but it was worth it in the end. And I, as you say, you know, ten years has gone by, and they've become a huge landmark, a real big success in Scotland and the UK, I should add, and and really well known icon. So we're, we're very proud that we stuck with it and uh, saw it through. And uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty major achievement. So it's uh, nice to look back on it now. Yeah. Well, the Helix Park yeah. is such a fantastic yes, uh, project Absolutely that's wonderful. really revitalised that area. It certainly has. It's uh, It was an incredible achievement and people now kind of take it for granted. But, you know, that was previously uh, derelict land. It had been used as a dump for industry for decades, way back in ancient, well, Victorian, Edwardian times. And, and the way that they've transformed it and um, uh, made it into this uh, beautiful, Sorry, beautiful park is just absolutely stunning, and uh, I'm just very proud that the Kelpies are the sort of uh, flagship of the of the canal that runs through there, and um, it's a, it's been an incredible transformation for Falkirk and Grangemouth. And all along, I always said, and and just recently was talking about, was saying the most important thing for me was that the people of Falkirk and Grangemouth appreciated the Kelpies first and foremost above everybody else, and I'm pleased to say that seems to be the case. So all round, I think everybody involved should be very proud. But also it shows how putting in a piece of sculpture and making a destination of somewhere absolutely could really revitalize and bring to life an area. Absolutely, Camilla. It's, as long as, um, yeah, again, people overlook uh, some of the things that happened in the history of the project. You know, we, we came out of the back of the big recession, 2007, 2008, and it was extremely brave of uh, my client team at Falkirk Council and Scottish Canals to, to stick with it. But I'm glad I'm glad to see that they they uh, shared my vision, as it were, and uh, they kind of listened to me when I told them that it could have a transformative effect, and and that we really had to stick with it. And uh, history has proven us right, you know, and it does, as you say, show that good public art in the right place uh, at the right time, I guess, can really have that incredible incredible effect. It creates a sense of um, pride of place and and uh, and ownership in an area that is difficult to put into words, but it really does work. And uh, they stand testament to that, I guess. 
before we leave the Kelpies, we must explain to the uh, American audience listening that if they don't know where Falkirk is, if yeah. they see it sitting between Edinburgh and Glasgow, yeah. that isn't four hours away. Oh, no. That no, little oh, bit yeah. is like <laughs> half an hour, 40 yeah. minutes. Geography, geography is very different in central Scotland. Yeah, it's only 40 minutes away. And many of our American friends who visited couldn't believe that they were actually in a different town because of the size of the, the cities over here. So relatively speaking, very close, more or less bang in the middle between Glasgow and Edinburgh and very well connected by motorways and, and public transport. And, you know, it's really quite something. They've had, I'm going to say six or seven million tourists have visited the site now in a town of only 40,000 people. So you can imagine the, the transformative effect that that's had over the years. Um, I mean, it's all relative. We're not Paris, London, New York, but for a small town in central Scotland, it really is an amazing achievement. And then I have to say, as I was catching up on a lot of your work, I I had not seen the Rennie McIntosh statue yeah. or i'd yeah. seen it and and not taken it in sure. it is beautiful thank you yeah thank you it was a, a rare occasion where i was allowed uh, by a client to uh, show off my clay modeling work most of my stuff as you probably know is steel welded steel but um i had had the idea of a memorial for macintosh for a few years bubbling away in the background and and i was very pleased to eventually find a client who although to be fair, they were originally speaking to me about something completely different for that location. And just by sheer good luck, he happened to see the little models I made of, of Charles Ronnie McIntosh and uh, things fell into place. And he uh, very uh, generously, his organization decided to fund it as a memorial for the man. And it now stands in what's known as the Anderston area of Glasgow uh, towards the west end of the city. And it's and that, past and the, the, the tall back ladder chair. Yeah, yeah, the Argyle chair is very famous, Argyle chair, and nicely actually sits on the edge of Argyle Street in Glasgow, so there's a connection there. And uh, it's in Cast Bronze. We, uh, as, as I said before, we were, um, we actually won the commission while we were still in Glasgow. And then I had to tell the client we were moving to Philadelphia, and he was very uh, uh, cool about it all. He just said, "Look, Andy, as long as you get it there on time and don't charge me any more money, we're fine." So, so we did exactly that. I modelled it all up in the Philadelphia studio. We cast it in Philly and then sent it across in a container, and it arrived on bang on time, and everybody was delighted with it. But have you been doing more with your sculpting work? Because um. I have seen some of your horse, uh, you've done some sculptures of horses and horse yeah. heads and yeah. different things. Have you been doing more of that? Yeah, yeah. I'm still, uh, right now, there's a big Clydesdale horse in the studio taking shapes, nearly finished. It's about 12, 13 feet high to the to the head. Um, and uh, there's another couple of clay pieces upstairs. So, yeah, horses are always going to be part of my, my repertoire. I've kind of fallen in love with them as a subject matter and, and they're still very much part of my practice and everyone I try and challenge myself a little bit with a different pose or a different breed of horse. And we currently also have a couple of inquiries just out of reach, which will be uh, equine based, shall we say. I, I can't say too much about them, but we have our fingers <laughs> crossed. So yeah, the, the horses are always there, but you know, um, it, it's a it's a business as well as a, as an art practice, Camilla. So, you know, you, you have to pay the bills and you, you've got to make ends meet. And uh, as a result of that, we take on different types of projects, you know, um, commissions, sometimes it's human figures, sometimes different subject matters. And um, I'm always, uh, I guess I always feel very flattered and honoured that people even ask me to do things for them. So I'm more than happy to uh, to undertake whatever commission comes along and that suits my genre and my, my way of working. Uh, so it might be a horse this week and it could be a giant elephant next week. Who knows? <laughs> well, you did a bear for John did, Muir, yes. didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we did one to commemorate John Muir over in Dunbar in Scotland. Yeah. He, the founding father of America's National Parks, as, as you well know. And uh, they, they already had a statue, a traditional statue of John Muir in the town of Dunbar in Scotland. So when the client approached me to do something for the town, I thought of doing something a little bit more, uh, I guess you could call it surreal, um, and decided to come up with a giant grizzly bear. My rationale would be that the bear would represent the National Parks of America. And if people would see it as a fantastic big sculpture of a bear anyway, perhaps a little surprising and quirky. But if they thought about it a little bit more, they would get the connection with John Muir and the United States and the national parks. And and again, that one's become very successful uh, on the edge of the town there of Dunbar. And it's on right beside the A1 highway, which takes you north to Edinburgh. So uh, well, a lovely I think big piece. you better go, go up and see them in Monterey and see what they are. Uh, 
in um, and see what they're up to there and yeah. see like getting a bear up there. Yeah, it's all about connections. Who knows what the future holds? Yeah, it'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? We did have, we had an inquiry for a bear here in California, but sadly it did, the, the client just, they changed their mind. I don't know what happened. Quite often, a little thing behind the scenes here is, you know, sometimes projects just disappear for no rhyme or reason. You never quite know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, so, yeah, just about last year, we were thinking of doing a bear that would have been about 36 feet long. But uh, sadly, it, it fell through. It didn't even go to somebody else. The client just changed their mind. So that's sometimes what Well, it's delayed for now. Yeah, so that's a good way to look at it. You never know what's going to happen next. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what... Are you have you got any exhibits that are upcoming or um, that you're well, going to show? Because you did do um an exhibit before COVID back yeah, in New York, and that right. was lovely. Thank you. Yeah, that that came about from Glasgow Caledonia University, who had yep. a campus building in 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 Manhattan there, and they still do. And uh, they very generously offered me that space for a show. We do, in fact, I mean, galleries, gallery shows aren't really usually my uh, thing, Camilla, as you know, most of my stuff is too large for a traditional gallery setting, but we have been offered a show here in California, in, in uh, LA, uh, sometime in the spring of next year, the date's not been 100% confirmed, but that would be a gallery show of smaller bronze studies and maquettes and hopefully a couple of bigger steel pieces too, in uh, a gallery called the Vifa Gallery in uh I guess you would call it South Bay, Palos Verdes area of Los Angeles. So uh, watch this space and we'll let you know about that when it comes out. Uh, well, do. In springtime, yeah. yeah do, we'll... we'd love to know that. Yeah, it's, and... it's, it's very unusual for me because as I say most of my stuff tends to be much bigger and, and you know, involving cranes and trucks. Now I've got to get my head around these little clay bronze things. So it's a whole different kettle of fish, but we'll see how we go. But they're beautiful. Thank you. Because That's when you did you. that exhibit at the Caledonian uh, yeah. campus, yeah. they were absolutely great fabulous thank you thank you it was, it was a lovely show thank you very much it was very kind of you to say and i'm pleased to say we even sold a few there as well which was a, an added bonus which made it all worth the expense and actually one of those pieces ended up becoming a very major commission um uh, uh, an agent for a collector in mexico saw one of the little bronzes and asked us if we could make it 10 feet by about 13 feet which we did and now this uh, this giant minotaur sculpture sits down in a private collection just outside Mexico City. Wow. So you, you never know how those little gal gallery shows with the bronzes can work out. So it was very, very good. Now, you did a book. Is that still we had available? A book, yeah. No, the sad news about that is that the publisher actually went bust. And I hasten to add, that was nothing to do with us. But the publisher went out of business. And sadly, um, we have never managed to find a new publisher to, to take on the book. We... You know, it's one of these things where um, you'd be publishing books, as you as you probably know, is is not the path to riches that some people think. No. And finding a publisher who wants to take it on, when a lot of the publishing houses are controlled down in London and they're not so aware of the Kelpies and it's a very London centric business, and we found it pretty tough. Hanika, as you recall, Hanika is my wife yeah. and my manager, and she really pursued a few things, but we just couldn't get anything to fall into place. We've not given up entirely, and I think yeah. now with the Kelpies having stood the test of time and so many other projects out of our, under our belt, we, we might well revisit that in the, the very near future and try and find a publisher to do something, probably based on the Kelpies, but maybe we're covering a few of the other projects too. Um, well, I'll share an email with you with a couple of ideas. Oh, please do. Thank you. Going Thank you. That. Yeah, yeah, please do. It's... Uh, so many people ask us for it, but it's just tricky to find the time and find the right people to pull it all together, you know. Um, but yeah, maybe one of these days. Watch this space. I'm writing a note to myself right okay, now. Okay, very good. Um, so I think art publishing is having a resurgence. I hope so. I and hope so. so. And, uh, and I hope there's so an opening for a couple of big horses. Let's <laughs> see if we can watch this space. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's really wonderful to catch up with you. Likewise. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time to let us no join problem. you. No I problem. mean, you really are doing these mammoth, mammoth works. I remember the first time I saw you in your studio, you're up on a scaffold yeah. with the, the mask <laughs> over yeah, you yeah. Yeah. and the welding torch right. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, it, the people don't realize what a huge physical thing it is. Correct. They don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, it's not all glamour. I can show you that. No, <laughs> um, actually, you might be able to hear some noise in the background. I've got my colleague Rob here working away there while I'm chatting with you. Um, we're 
finishing uh, the horse, as I mentioned. We also have a big uh, piece going to Minnesota in the next few weeks, which has got a 90-foot wingspan, so that's a pretty big piece. That'll be heading over there soon. And, yeah, we're keeping busy. Everything's good. So, uh, yeah. Well, we, well, I'll be hopefully out in L.A. in the, you know, probably in January. I okay. promised um, Beverly that I would yeah. come out and see okay. her for, for their Burns night. Okay, and lovely, so lovely. I think that um, maybe we're, we'll be, I'll be able to come and see you welding away. Sure, then. yeah, you'd be very welcome come to the studio. Absolutely. We'll keep in touch and I'll, I'll see you there anyway with Kimberly and her colleagues. And in the meantime, thanks very much for asking me to join you and have a wee chat. It's always a pleasure. You take care. All Thank the best you to you, so All the best. Say hello bye to bye. New York from us. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye. <laughs>
also to your art and there are several projects that you've been doing over the years that you're still doing work for such as the ballerinas which were such a wonderful early series that I'm very we're all very aware of and then of course the sortar so can you talk a little bit of what's been going on with those and with other additions that you've been doing? Um, okay. So part of my problem is that I have a very um, short span of attention. Um, I can only focus on one thing for, for a, a certain amount of time. Um, that was a problem for me. It was seriously a problem for me going through school. But what I have done with that and recognising that as a, as a, potentially a weakness, I think I've turned it into a strength. So the answer for me has always been to have lots of things on the go at the same time um, so that I can leapfrog, I can, I can move between different um, disciplines, different projects in the studio. And I'm lucky enough in the studio that I have, that I have an enormous space uh, physically, a, a huge space that I can work in. So I can physically move from, from one discipline to the other. I have the main painting wall where the, the difficult stuff takes place, but I have project spaces within the studio. Um, one of the main things actually, which I suppose has, has, has come to the fore over the last few years is sculpture. Um, I'm working in three dimensions. Um, some of the of the elements which would have been recognizable in my painting um, have been, have emerged also in the three dimensional work. Um, there's a beautiful um, small sculpture of a girl with a flag, and basically that's something which I've always felt um, I should have been doing, but never really had the time 
to, to devote to it. So again, COVID, mm-hmm. COVID pushed me into that space where I, I found I simply couldn't paint all the time. Um, so I had to had to do something else in the studio. So that's um, that's emerging as a really as a really big deal for me. Um, do you have a series of smaller sculptures that you're expanding on now? I do. I do. Oh, they, how fabulous! You, I remember you, some of your small ballerinas. Yes. So so there are some new ballerinas which have come through, and um, one in particular which I'm very very excited about. And what I try to do, Camilla, um, this will maybe sound slightly disingenuous, but I try to remove myself from the process as far as that's possible. If I can use technology, if I can bring in um, help in the process, this is not new. This is what the old masters did. Um, yeah. Basically, you establish a process and you can then bring in um, other artists um, to work with you. As the part school of... of- School of, yeah, yeah. So you, first of all, you have to establish a, a, a process. You have to establish a way of working which you can then bring help into. And I did that a long, long time ago. Um, so I'm able to break the paintings down and bring help in at different layers of the paintings. So what I did with these sculptures was um, I partnered with Edinburgh University's material sciences department. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've incorporated 3D printing into the process. So basically a 3D print notionally gets me from zero to let's call it 65, 70% of where I want to be. I don't know how much you know about 3D printing, but it's an amazing process. So I could take you tomorrow and have you scanned in a few days' time, I would roughly speaking have a, imagine it as a camera out of focus. I would have a version of Camilla, which um, I could then <laughs> I could then build upon. The problem was that I, with these 3D prints, I, I was unable to do anything with the print itself. So it's been a long and fairly tortuous process. To, to create um, the layers between the 3D print and a finished piece, which involves wax, it involves moulds. Lots, the lost wax moulding, yeah. That's it, that's it. So basically the, the end product is still bronze. And the fascinating thing about this is that I am using the most up-to-date um, printing, 3D printing process available to create sculptures which could have been created 500 years ago. So there's a circle there in terms of the way that I work. It's the same with my painting. My paintings are created in a very traditional way, but I use Photoshop, I use digital um, imaging, all to create paintings which could have been created 500 years ago. And if Leonardo da Vinci had been, I had access to di- digital um, processing, He'd have been in there like a shot. So I know that I'm jumping a little bit forward, but you sort of led us into it. Um, your other great love and uh, and area that you're expanding on so much has been portraiture. Yeah, for sure. Are you using some of this technique within your portraiture? Yes, absolutely. So, um, okay, let me take it back a step. So there are lots of nonsense fantasy ideas about um, the way that things should be done. People who don't really know anything about art, who don't know anything about painting. So when I first started making portraits, there was this whole idea that you had to have the sitter present at all times. (laughs) And I did that and I found it, it was unbearable. Um, I think my empathy levels are too high. I was so acutely aware of the sitter, I couldn't concentrate on the painting. You, people imagine that this, there, there's no, some, no one way to make a painting. And I've always erred on the side of whatever gets me to the best possible end product, that's the route that I'll go down. So I, for many, many, many years, for in fact, since the very beginning, I've used photography. 
um, I take hundreds of photographs and basically the sitter is involved in the choice. Digital photography then began to really, to, to, to begin to begin, began to get to a point where it was equal to um, what would be classed as di uh, original photography. So I use Photoshop. Um, I take hundreds of photographs um, in the sitting and it means that the individual who's commissioning the portrait, they're not presented with a finished portrait. They are part of the process. They can choose the image that they feel they're, they're happiest with. Um, context matters massively. You know, I don't need to have the sitter in the space that they will finally occupy in the finished painting. We can play around with that in the in the digital space. So you create this thing from lots of disparate elements, but ultimately it still goes back to oil paint on canvas. Okay. That's where it ends up. And I, when we talked earlier, I was really, we, we must mention that you now have the wonderful uh, you are now exhibited in the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery of Scotland, which is a fabulous accolade and, 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 and congratulations. And so there are three portraits there. Could you tell us a little bit about them? The first one is a portrait I made of Alex Salmond um, for a, a portrait exhibition which took place in Glasgow in 2014. Um, his portrait was taken into the National Portrait Gallery, I think, in 2016, I think. Um, a second portrait that I had made for the, the last big portrait exhibition over in New York in 2015 um, um, of a, a brilliant Scottish author called Denise Mina, um, an amazing girl, really amazing. And the last portrait, which uh, is possibly arguably the most powerful of the three um, is of the sadly now deceased um, Scottish rugby player Doddy Weir. Um, I had the opportunity to paint Doddy um, in 2019. Um, I made a portrait which we took to Hong Kong um, to help raise funds for Doddy's foundation. Doddy um, had MND and he set up a foundation um, which raised millions of pounds into research into MND. So I made this portrait which we took to um, Hong Kong to a major fundraising event down there and we raised £150,000 via the portrait for his foundation. And the portrait then came back to the National Portrait Gallery um, in Edinburgh. So that's there was no plan for it to be there permanently, but um, the word is that now that it's there, it's it's loved. He is loved. Um, so I think that portrait will be part of the collection there forever. Wonderful. And you're doing more and more portraits. It's my thing. Um, I love portraits because they are <laughs> the most difficult thing that I do. Um, it's so easy to get a portrait wrong. Um, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there are people listening, watching, who either have had portraits painted, who have seen portraits. So you've got to work out why, first of all, if you're going to paint a portrait, why are you, why go down that route in the first place? And you also need to work out who you're painting. If I were painting you, Camilla, who am I painting? And from all of the, the different facets, you could choose to, to, to highlight for every single individual. You need to work out who you're painting. Is it the, the businessman? Is it the grandparent? Is it the, the businesswoman? Is it the actor? Is it the actress? You know, you have to work out. And basically, so my portraits, I would argue, I've always argued are 95% psychology. Unless you understand who it is you're painting, you have no hope of delivering on the on the finished piece. So, so the quirkiness and the dimensions of the person is important. Absolutely. You think um, 
if, as I say, let's take, you know, for example, businessman, family man, businesswoman, family woman. Those are two completely different briefs and two completely different portraits. Um, so as I say, I spend a lot of time really trying to flesh that out before we move to take photographs, before we make a mark on canvas. I really do hope you're going to be back over here in the States soon. I so enjoyed it when you had your exhibits here and we had a chance to, to see your work up close. Um, we've It's wonderful that we've been able to do these um, catch-ups via Zoom and also that you've opened Fair Hills for um, people to visit at certain times, which is fantastic. But now you also have your music. So I think there's a, this Renaissance man um, <laughs> needs to get over here. We need to be able to share all this. Wow, so, wouldn't that be something? That well, be no, something. I think we've got to see that happening soon. And I think the fact of how well you've explained the, the, the multi-dimensional way you're doing your work, using new technology together with your skills as an artist is, is fascinating. So I'm so excited. And can we ask you before we close to tell us what piece of music you'd like to close this with? Because I think this is, it's wonderful to hear that your band is, uh, is, is progressing, what's coming next, yep. and all of this work you're doing and your photographic work as well, so which is wonderful. Yeah, it's all in the mix. Um, and as I say, that short span of attention is the is the thing that drives it all. And also, I suppose, Camilla, at the age of 63, there's a danger that you could settle. You know, I have several different themes, several different things I'm known by. So you could settle, you could say, I'm the guy who does the, the salt tires, I'm the guy who does the... Um, it's just not my nature. I think that you always want to be pushing out, see what's out there, you know, and if you can use it, why wouldn't you? That That's the thing for no, me. I, I, you are such, an, such a central part of the Scottish art scene at this moment, and to have you speak with us, we're very honoured. And so tell us what we should play at the end of this. Oh, good grief. Um, so one song, we only ever released one single, a single, a song called Real Surprise. And actually it was the song I liked least from the band's overall output. However, we have revisited that song um, 40 years later. So there's a live recording of that as part of the Lantern House, which I think is absolutely beautiful. Um, so I think that would be the perfect one to finish up on. Well, you are always full of surprises. And let's keep it that way. Okay. So to speaking soon again, and to now closing with real surprise. Okay, Camilla. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. It was so good to hear from Andy and from Jared of all they are doing. Join us the first and third Monday of the month for more episodes now sitting on your favorite podcast platform. Join us also on our website to find out what we're up to, AmericanScottishFoundation.org. Until next time.